Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Evans, your host for Heroes in the Bible. And if you've been enjoying this series, please write a review and let me know how this podcast has impacted your life. Welcome to the Epic Adventure of David, a story of honor, battle, jealousy, darkness, friendship, love, scandal, and murder. While most people know of David the myth, few know about David the man. In this episode, David is the one who needs saving. Yes, our valiant hero is going to need rescuing, but not from Philistines or King Saul. David needs somebody to save him from his own poor decision-making. This episode introduces a new character, Abigail. She's not a warrior, scholar, or princess, but she is the exact person David needs right now. This is a short episode about three things. The emotional toll exile has taken on David and his men, the wisdom of a wife making up for the folly of a husband, and a new budding romance that comes at the perfect time. David has been in the wilderness for a while. His men are skilled, but are weary. The fatigue of battle and lethargy of months on the run without the comforts of a home have put them in a perfect position to make a bad decision. God sent someone to save them just in time. We can't expect David to make the right decision every time without guidance and providence. Before we meet Abigail, we go to a funeral. The prelude features a very recent event for David, where he mourns the death of a beloved friend and grieves the betrayal of his first love. Without further ado, here is episode 13, Abigail. Prelude to chapter 13. Thousands of people flocked to the burial site of Samuel, wailing into the heavens. The great leader and last judge of Israel had breathed his final breath, and the entire nation mourned his death. The skies were gray, as if the heavens themselves were ready to weep. Saul stood in front of the throng of people, facing Samuel's gravesite. His hands trembled, and he let out a cry of lament in unison with the people behind him. All were crushed and bereaved. Behind the congregation, cloaked and hooded in the shadows, was David. He watched from a distance as the nation said goodbye to their prophet and father. David held his head low, weeping silently for the loss of the man who had been first to recognize his calling. David looked up and saw his wife, Michal, sitting beside her father and brother. To her left was another man, Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Galim. He linked arms with Michal and consoled her. David had heard the rumors that Saul had given Michal to him in marriage, but now he knew it to be true. His heart was broken for the loss of Samuel and for the loss of his wife. David was no longer the outlawed son-in-law of the king. He was simply an outlaw. He let the reality of his standing sink in. He breathed in deeply and prayed to the Lord silently. Then, before anyone had the chance to recognize him, David fled back to Paran, where he and his men had built a new home for themselves in the countryside. Chapter 13 Abigail Cutting through the narrow road from Paran to Carmel was a group of young men herding their sheep back to their master's property. The road cut through some trees on the outskirts of the wilderness, providing shade for the young men and their sheep. It was a warm spring afternoon. The birds chirped and flew from branch to branch, singing sweet melodies to the travelers down below. However, their songs were not a comfort to the young men. They knew that the bending road beside the forest was filled with bandits and raiders from the western tribes of Philista. The young shepherds held their staffs tightly and turned their heads at the sound of every broken twig. Master Nabal wasn't right to send us out here without guards. One of them said with a trembling voice. Perhaps he wants us to die, another said. All ten of the shepherds were young and inexperienced in combat. They knew if bandits came, they would be utterly defenseless. The tree covering became thick, and the sun was nearly blocked entirely. As darkness shrouded the young men and their sheep, a rustling could be heard from the darkness. Before the young men could brace themselves, a group of bandits emerged from the shadows to attack. The sheep scattered in fear as the young shepherds desperately tried to defend themselves. The bandits attacked with clubs, swords, and hammers. They began taking the sheep and attacked the boys for the money in their bags. The men attacked with a flurry of blows and jabs. They were tackled to the ground and bound in rope. 
Do we kill the boys that round up their sheep, or do we hold them for ransom? One of them asked the others. They were sent into the forest with no protection. Clearly they are worth nothing to their master. Let us kill them and take whatever's left in the flock. The rest of them agreed and laughed as they advanced towards the boys to kill them. They brought their swords up to their necks, posturing to swipe it across their throats. Yet before they could move another inch, a stone flew through the air and hit one of them directly in the forehead. A crack of the skull preceded a large thud of the bandit hitting the floor. The rest of them looked over and gasped as David and his men came storming forward. The men ran for their lives, but David would not let them leave without tasting justice. Asahel, one of David's finest warriors, ran ahead of the others, bridging the gap between him and the fleeing bandits. He caught them, cutting them down at the ankles. The others caught up and took back what had been stolen from the shepherds. Bruised and beaten, the bandits retreated back into the shadows. David helped the young men back up to their feet. Together, they went back to their camp, and the shepherds were given a warm meal and hospitality. David crouched by the fire and smiled. My men have retrieved the rest of your sheep. All will be returned to your master. The shepherds were grateful. Where do you come from? He asked. We are servants of Nabal. His land is at Carmel. He is an incredibly wealthy man, but he is strict. It brings us great relief that you have saved us. If those bandits did not kill us, surely Nabal would have. David nodded and acknowledged their gratitude. And we have been here for a few months now. There are many evil men who have sought the vulnerable travelers. We have been keeping a close eye on the roads, ensuring no harm comes to them. David stared at the fire and sighed. However, it has been a weary task keeping ourselves and others safe. It would be nice to share a warm meal during this festive time. It would be a grand gesture for your master to show us some hospitality. My men are in need of respite from the long days and cold nights. We could inquire of our master on your behalf, the shepherd said. It's the least we could do after you've saved us. May the Lord bless you for your kindness, David said. Go up to Nabal and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, Nabal. Good health to you and your household. I humbly request your kindness towards my men since we are here at a festive time. Please be generous to us for how we have treated your men and grant us any sort of hospitality. The shepherds looked at one another, not sure if Nabal would be the sort to accept David's offer. However, they had a debt to pay, so they ventured off with their sheep to their master. A few of David's servants went with them so they might return the message. David watched them leave, hopeful that he and his men could get one act of kindness. Just one. The shepherds returned to Nabal's property, nestled between the rolling hills and forests of Carmel. The large green pastures were filled with goats and other livestock. Gardens circled the perimeter of his home, blooming with lush and vibrant colors. The young men entered the great halls of Nabal's home. Large cedar beams held up the high ceilings, and servants laced the halls, busy preparing yet another large feast for Nabal and his friends. Nabal was at a large seat in the center of the room, like a king would on his throne. He was a large and foul-looking man. His large and haggard beard hid the rotting teeth in his mouth. He sat on his throne, as he often did, half drunk and berating his servants. Beside him was his wife Abigail. She was a young woman, given to him in marriage by her father. Unlike her surly and moronic husband, Abigail was a kind and wise young woman. She held herself with honor and dignity, treating the servants of the household with respect and compassion. However, even her calm and elegant demeanor could not offset the flagrant nature of her husband. He raged against his entire household and abused his authority. The shepherds approached with caution with David's servants close behind. Nabal glared at them and pointed to the strangers entering his halls. Not only do you come late with the sheep, but you bring strangers into my home. Explain yourselves. Lord, we were attacked on the road by bandits. They took our sheep and nearly took our lives. Yet praise be to God that David and his men came swiftly to our aid and saved us. They even retrieved your sheep 
and escorted us home. These are his servants. They are here to humbly request your hospitality. Just as David's servants were about to speak, Nabal rose his hand and began to chuckle. David? He shouted. Who is David? That outlaw son of Jesse? I see many slaves are leaving their masters these days. He scoffed. The portly landowner leaned over and spat in the servant's direction. Why should I offer my bread, my meat, and my water and give it to some worthless nobody like him? Get out of my sight before I call my dogs on you. The servants said nothing. They simply bowed and left the halls. <laughs> Nabal continued to laugh and drink, leaning back in his seat satisfied. Abigail peered over to him. Are you certain you want to insult the man who saved Israel from the Philistines? She said quietly. Nabal glared at his wife. He spat to the side and held out his empty cup. Get me more wine, wife. You are more beautiful when you quietly fill my cup. Abigail said nothing. She took her husband's cup and left into the kitchen. David's men arrived that night. All the others were sitting by the fires, eating and laughing. David was among them, telling valiant stories of battle beside Jonathan. When the servants approached, he could tell they were despondent. Why the downcast faces, brothers? David asked. The men sat down and rubbed their faces. Nabal has rejected our request, they said. Why is that? David asked as he sat down beside them. He said he did not want to waste his resources on a nobody like you. He called you a slave who ran away from his master. David's entire countenance changed. The rest of the men stepped back, feeling the anger leaking from his pores. David's bones were shaking in rage. He stood to his feet and stormed to his tent. The men wondered if he had retreated for the night to think and pray as he often did. However, he did not. He emerged from the tent, fully clothed in his armor with his sword strapped to his side. All of you, strap on your swords, David commanded. They did not question him. Each man retrieved his weapon and stood at attention. Some of you will stay and watch camp. 400 of you will come with me. I will not allow Nabal to dishonor us after everything we have done for his land. It is a disgrace, and I will not allow him to spite us. Asahel! David shouted. The young man stood at attention in front of his commander. You are the fastest among us. You will go ahead and tell the shepherds we met to take cover. For destruction is on its way to Nabal's house. Asahel bowed his head and ran into the wilderness. His long and lean legs burst like a gazelle's. David knew word would reach them quick. David turned to the rest of his men and gestured for them to march forward. We go now. We shall make it to the front of Nabal's land before daybreak. So the men marched silently. No one dared speak to David or question his judgment. David did not boil with fury often, but when he did, the men knew not to approach him. In his belly was a righteous fire that would consume all who approached. Abigail. The door burst open and one of the shepherds came into her room. I'm sorry, mistress, but I must speak with you. What is wrong? Abigail asked gently. Her hair was down and draped over her shoulders. The shepherd was lost for a moment in her beauty. Her eyes were a light hazel, and in them held the wisdom and tact of a true leader. However, she had been relegated to basic household chores. David gave a request to your husband for a simple act of kindness, yet... He hurled insults back at him, and I fear the anger of David has been kindled against him. The shepherd said, Is this David so fragile that he would kill my husband just for insulting him? That does not sound like the man of legend everyone speaks of. Abigail said, That is not it at all, my lady. David and his men were very good to us. They provided protection for us. They put their own lives in danger to help us when they could have simply looked the other way. They did not mistreat us or get territorial. In fact, they even helped us round our sheep back up. He was our protector, and he is the reason Nabal did not lose his entire flock. Now do you understand why David would be so insulted? The shepherd boy was beginning to shake in fear and sorrow. Clearly, David had a lasting impact on him. In just a matter of days, David 
was able to engender more loyalty in this boy than Nabal could in years. Who is this man? Abigail thought to herself. She was intrigued. My husband is a stubborn man, Abigail said. I cannot convince him to apologize even if David threatens his life. Then what shall we do? I'm sure David will come to kill all the men under Nabal's guard. Abigail pondered for a moment. She tied up her hair and rolled up her sleeves. Come down with me. We shall make this right. Abigail ventured to the ovens and kitchen. She clapped her hands together and grabbed the attention of the servants. Come with me. We haven't got much time. Together, they baked and gathered 200 loaves of bread. They poured two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, and five seahs of roasted grain. Abigail and the others also made a hundred raisin cakes and two hundred cakes of fresh figs. Help me gather everything in baskets. We shall load them on the donkey. Abigail ordered. Quickly, it is almost sunup. Abigail worked tirelessly. Then, once the baskets were loaded onto a donkey, she sent two of her maidservants to go and deliver them to David. Go and meet the men before they come and attack. Tell them I will be close behind. The maidservants did as they were told and took the donkey up the hill towards the mountain ravine. The sun was rising over the mountain range. David and his men stood in the narrow ravine looking down at Nabal's estate. They waited for the first light to show itself behind them. The sun's rays burst forth, uninhibited by any cloud covering. The warmth of the new morning was a sweet relief to David's men, who had been marching all night. David drew his sword and breathed in deeply. He was unable to calm himself all night. His fury was steady and unwavering. Shama could see David's hands trembling with rage. Are you ready, David? He asked gently. David turned and clenched his jaw. It has been useless watching over this man's property all these weeks and keeping his servants safe. Not just with the shepherds, but all his other supplies coming in and out have been protected by us. I am done paying this man kindness, only to be repaid in insults. He paid back evil for good. May God deal with me severely if I leave one of his men alive by the time the day is finished. David turned back to his men and gestured for them to move forward. Just as they began marching, three figures appeared in the distance. Two women and a donkey approached. David held his men back and allowed them to come. They bowed before David and presented him with the gifts of cakes, bread, and wine. Our Lord, David, here is a gift from the house of Nabal. Shama and Eleazar looked in the baskets and laughed at the exorbitant amount of food and wine. However, David was suspicious of the gesture. Nabal sent these himself, David inquired. Not Nabal, but our mistress, Abigail. They replied. She is on her way to greet you now. David looked back at his men, still teeming with rage against Nabal. His disgruntled heart was still itching for a fight. He had been taken advantage of and ridiculed for the last time, and he wanted justice. However, all feelings of aggression and contempt seemed to melt away when David looked ahead to see Abigail. Her dark brown curls cascaded over her shoulders like waterfalls. She wore a dark green dress that hugged her body tightly. She wore no jewels upon her neck. It was elegant and beautiful enough, not needing any ornament to distract from just how perfect it was. Her light hazel eyes captured David's attention immediately, and he felt himself being pulled in close by them. David walked out to Abigail. They stopped in the middle, taking each other in for a long moment before speaking. Neither of them expected the other to look the way they did. Abigail scanned David up and down. He was not as tall and broad as one would expect from someone of his reputation. He was average height, but carried himself as if he was a hundred feet tall. She perused his body that had been formed from hours of running in the sheep pastures and battling Philistines. Her eyes met his. They were slightly hidden by his light curls that were swaying in the breeze. Abigail broke the silence and bowed to David. Please, my lord, pardon the household of my husband. Pay no attention to his wicked and ignorant comments. He is a fool. Folly follows that man like moths to a flame. Abigail lifted her head and gestured to the army of men behind David. They were waiting at a distance, ready for David's orders to attack. I have provided gifts for you and your men. 
May God bless you for your mercy against the house of Nabal. May he give you a long-lasting dynasty because you fight the Lord's battles, not petty squabbles because of an obtuse and cranky man. I know that even though King Saul pursues you, your life is bound securely by the Lord your God. The lives of your enemies will be hurled away like a stone from your sling. When God has fulfilled his calling for you and made you king, do you really want your conscience consumed with an act of needless bloodshed? Abigail's words were kind, tactful, and wise. David took notice that she was not only fair in appearance, but adorned with an inner beauty. A gentle yet strong spirit dwelled within her, and David was curious to discover more of it. He looked back at his men and gestured for them to be at ease. They immediately went for the baskets of bread and cakes. <laughs> David laughed and looked again at Abigail. He composed himself. Although he was a valiant and well-known warrior, inside, he could still feel like a child speaking to a beautiful woman. Praise the Lord for you, Abigail, he said. Your good judgment has kept me from mindless revenge and petty bloodshed. It is not like me to be kindled this easily. If God had not sent you, not one male in Nabal's home would have been left alive. I can only imagine what you and your men have been through. Abigail said. You have gone beyond what others would have done and protected the young men from raiders. Nabal cannot see what I see, that you are the next king of Israel. Abigail's words were like a bomb to David's wounded heart. This woman, a stranger, had also recognized David's calling as king. A bashful grin came across his face, <laughs> making him chuckle. <laughs> Abigail laughed as well. The two of them shared a small moment of connection, followed by a beautiful silence that David did not want to end. For he knew the next words would have to be, Go home in peace, Abigail. Your words have saved not only your husband's life, but also my integrity. Abigail bowed and returned to her donkey with her maidservants. David turned back to enjoy the gifts with his men. Both of them resisted the desire to turn around and steal another glance. As Abigail trotted back to her husband's home, she could not help but smile. David had listened to her and heeded her wisdom, something her husband had always refused to do. Abigail went back home. The servants were busy tending to the kitchen for one of Nabal's decadent feasts. He would hold large and elaborate banquets like that of a king, spoiling himself with expensive spirits and exotic meats. His gluttony and self-indulgence was famous throughout the region, and many rich men who shared the same proclivity for lavish dinners would join him. It was past noon, and the ball was already considerably drunk. Abigail entered the hall and sat next to him. Where have you been? Nabal slurred. My cup has been in need of filling. You are already drunk and it is just now high noon, Abigail whispered. Do not lecture me, Nabal said, grabbing Abigail's wrist tightly and pulling her in. You are mine, he laughed. <laughs> Abigail recoiled in disgust and pulled away. Nabal's grip became tighter. He gritted his teeth and brought Abigail in close for a kiss. She hated the way he treated her. She hated living under his roof and enduring his cruelty. However, she was bound by a marriage that was arranged by her father, trapped without love, a prisoner in her own home. Abigail was about to tell Nabal of how she saved him and his men. However, she held her tongue, knowing that there was no use in speaking with him in this state. She walked out, allowing him to drown himself in his own depravity. Abigail went up to her chambers and looked out the window. She longed for a different life, a life of adventure and intrigue. As she gazed out of the sunset, watching the light of day fade into the horizon, she thought of David. Early the next morning, Abigail found the ball hunched over his seat, half asleep over his breakfast. She sauntered in regally, not allowing his repulsive demeanor to ruin her morning. She sat at the other end of the table, pouring water from a basin into her cup. You and your friends ate all the bread last night, and there was none left for the shepherds and servants to eat. Abigail said abruptly. Woman, what did I tell you about lecturing me? Shut your mouth or I shall shut it for you. Nabal mumbled. Abigail fumed with anger. You ought to thank me, Nabal. 
I stopped David the Giant Slayer and his men from raiding our home and killing you last night. After you foolishly insulted him, he marched up against you. If it were not for me and these servants, you would have met the tip of his spear. Nabal's eyes widened and he burst out, flipping the table over. You insolent, childish, disobedient... Nabal stopped abruptly and gripped his chest. He gasped, reached forward for Abigail, then fell forward onto his face. The years of self-indulgence had come for a reckoning. Nabal's body became like a stone for ten days. Abigail faithfully attended to him, assuring he was comfortable and taken care of. Then, after ten days, the Lord struck Nabal dead, and his heart ceased to beat. The foul and angry husband of Abigail was dead, and she was made a widow to attend to the home alone. Word of Nabal's death spread, and one of David's messengers returned with the news. David's heart felt a sense of relief and thankfulness. Not that Nabal was dead, but that the Lord had spared him from spilling his blood. David walked into the woods and prayed to the Lord, saying, Praise you, God. Praise you for your justice and kindness. You upheld my cause against Nabal. You kept me from mindless bloodshed. You sent Abigail to... David stopped for a moment. He remembered Abigail. He remembered her kind and wise eyes and her smooth skin. He was thankful for her wisdom and devotion to the Lord. If it were not for her, David would have tarnished his name. He felt a flutter in his stomach and smiled. Abigail, what a breathtaking woman, he thought to himself. David closed his eyes and smiled. He shook his head and lifted his hands to heaven. He sprinted out of the woods and retrieved a horse. Without telling his men, David galloped to Nabal's home. It was late and the stars were brightly arrayed over the horizon. David rode up to Abigail's home and looked up. Abigail was once again sitting at her window. The two of them locked eyes. Abigail smiled and came down to David. She opened the door and David was there wearing a nervous grin. She let him in and the two of them spoke into the night. They shared their souls with one another, exchanging stories, emotions, and laughter. Abigail swooned over David. Yet what drew Abigail in most was not the way David looked, but the sound of his voice. Every word from his mouth was like a hymn specifically composed to make her heart swoon. Then, in one perfect moment, David kissed her. Their bodies drew close to one another, and all the pain of past years disappeared. For that one moment, David did not feel like a man on the run. Abigail did not feel like a forgotten bride, and David did not feel like a forgotten son. That night, they fell in love. The next day, Abigail left with David to be his bride. She would follow David and his men through the wilderness, offering her wisdom, affection, and devotion. The death of one thing usually signifies the birth of another. This is a prevailing theme in scripture as well as nature. If you are a resident of California or any area where wildfires are common, you know that the destruction of plants on the hills is usually replaced with new and lush life. The mountain ranges are singed, but it opens the seeds so new life can be born when the rain comes. This is the rhythm of Scripture. When there is a prominent death or loss of something significant, it signals to us that something new is coming. The prelude is a scene from Samuel's funeral. The death of Israel's last judge signals to us that change is coming. A new way to hear from God is coming, and David will be used to spark a new revival. Samuel was the moral compass of Israel, continually pointing them toward God. Without him, Israel will need someone to point them towards their true north. It can't be Saul, whose mind has completely descended into darkness. The role will be vacant until David can take the throne. The prelude also features a loss of relationship. As the rains pour and harps sound, David watches another man put his arms around his wife. He feels the pangs of heartbreak mixed with the sober reality that he is no longer a prince of Israel. He has no title given to him by marriage or status in Israel. All that remains is the legend of Goliath and rumors of his heroism in the wilderness. The people are still pining after him though eagerly awaiting the day when he can return. 
It has taken a long time for David to embody what everybody else knew to be true all along. He is the king. How much longer will we have to wait for his rise to the throne? You will have to keep listening to find out. After the prelude, we're sent back to the wilderness where David and his men have continued to watch over Israel like vigilantes. Their army of misfits rise up against bandits, highwaymen, and raiders that threaten the local properties and villages. In the beginning of the episode, David and his men free some shepherds that have been taken captive by bandits. They don't save them for any reward, but David does request that their master receive them into his home for the upcoming festival. It's been a while since David and his men have had any sort of respite, and they seem desperate for it. The men have adapted well to life on the run. However, they are creature comforts that they have been deprived of. For the sake of his men, David would take a break. This seems like the perfect opportunity for him to get his men some well-deserved rest. Nabal, however, returns David's kindness with an insult. David's reaction is somewhat uncharacteristic. The story tells us how David reacts. It says, David's entire countenance changed. The rest of the men step back, feeling the anger leaking from his pores. David's bones were shaking in rage. He stood to his feet and stormed to his tent. The men wondered if he had retreated for the night to think and pray as he often did. However, he did not. He emerged from the tent fully clothed in his armor with his sword strapped to his side. David wants to go scorched earth on Nabal. This furious reaction is out of character for someone as merciful as David. What set him off? A few things. First, one small dinner seemed like a fair reward for weeks of protection. Second, Nabal didn't simply refuse. He went out of his way to insult David. Third, he had his men attired. We can't ignore the human element of these stories. Have you ever been tired, hungry, and insulted all at once? Think of all the harsh things you have said and done because you lack sleep, food, and basic courtesy. Imagine that feeling times a thousand. David is feeling the fatigue of fighting in the wilderness, defending his country, being abandoned by his wife, and grieving Samuel. And now, Nabal flagrantly denigrates David after saving his servants. Nabal stepped on a landmine, and David is about to explode. Let's pause for a moment and revisit something we have talked about in previous episodes. David's outrage is not meant to give us an example of what we are allowed to do. In Scripture, there are descriptions and prescriptions. Descriptions are meant to tell us what happened, and we can parse through the story to find messages that pertain to us. Prescriptions are meant to tell us what we should do and how we should act in a specific situation. The Old Testament in particular is filled with descriptions of events, such as Jacob having several wives. Now, that does not mean the Bible condemns polygamy. Certainly not. The story is describing what happened, and the events of Jacob's life warn us that polygamy is a blatantly wrong thing to do. David is ready to march against Nabal and slaughter every man under his rank. And that is not meant to tell us revenge is okay. In fact, what happens next in the story sends the opposite message. We are introduced to Abigail, Nabal's wife, and the theme of contrast is reintroduced in this episode. Nabal is gluttonous, sour, and foolish, while Abigail is beautiful, kind, and wise. She knows what a grave mistake her husband has made and seeks to prevent David's wrath from falling on his household. This introduces us to an eternal and prevailing concept. A good woman is necessary to tame a bad man. Nabal, unfortunately for Abigail, is a particularly unruly beast. He is angry, rude, and contemptuous. His drunkenness makes him unable to appreciate the treasure he has. She is poised under pressure, tries to right the wrongs caused by her husband by providing gifts to David and his men. David is another beast in need of taming, and Abigail comes out to do so. Unlike Nabal, David submits to Abigail's kindness. Her gesture calms him down and sets his mind straight. She is the guiding conscience and tempered voice that David didn't know he needed. David's son Solomon would eventually go on to write, A kind word turns away wrath. Abigail's kindness turns away David's wrath, and he is sober enough to see 
What a terrible mistake he was about to make. Abigail saved David from his own rage. Marching against Nabal's house would have been a terrible sin, and David would have regretted it for the rest of his life. This beautiful stranger stepped in like an angel, touched his weary soul, and soothed him back to sanity. David and Abigail go their separate ways, both wondering about the other. It makes sense, doesn't it? Abigail is married to a pig, and David's wife has just been given to another man. It is inevitable that they would be drawn to each other. Circumstances make way for their romance to continue, as Nabal falls dead from what we can assume was a heart attack. Ah, gluttony, the most subtle of all the deadly sins. Its bite is slow, comforting, and cruel. It came for Nabal, leaving Abigail a widow. It came as no surprise to any of us that she and David fell in love shortly after. They would wed, and Abigail rode off with David into the wilderness for a life of adventure. We don't hear much about Abigail after this. There will be a glimpse of her from time to time, but for the most part, she will remain hidden in the margins of David's story. However, her influence will become clear as David navigates life as a hero, king, poet, and politician. Not every figure in David's life is mentioned as much as we'd like, but we're grateful for their influence in his life nonetheless. We will look for signs of her wisdom and temperance in David's life as the story continues. In our next episode, David will need to hold firm to his convictions and not give in to passion. We can only hope that as the pressure mounts, he can remain tethered to wisdom. Join us next time for episode 14, The King's Spear. Thank you for listening. For more inspiring stories, daily prayers, and wisdom to last a lifetime, go to Pray.com. And to expand your Heroes in the Bible journey, download the Heroes of the Faith devotional at TonyEvans.org forward slash heroes. Write a review and let us know how this podcast has impacted your life. God bless. Hello, my name is Matthew Potter, co-founder of Pray.com. I wanted to ask, do you know what your bank does with your money? At America's Christian Credit Union, your everyday banking helps grow churches, expand the reach of missions agencies, and supports fellow believers across the country. Learn more about specials for switching to ACCU and their nationwide banking capabilities at americaschristiancu.com forward slash pray. Plus, the peace of mind knowing that this credit union is federally insured by the National Credit Union Administration.